Welcome for Learn at Home. This is a program where we get to share, they've been really wonderful lectures, talks, and giving you at home the tools to make a more climate resilient future, whether that's at home, whether that's with policy, we're just really excited that you're all here joining us today. Um, and Chris, would you go to the next slide? Uh -oh. And so it's, and we learn at home is made possible by our generous donors. If you would like to know, we have many ways, uh, tree dedications, we have many ways to get involved and donate. Um, you can also, if you would like to donate your time, please visit treepeople.org slash volunteer. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Chris Imhoff, who is the director of uh, its uh, programs. Program development. Program development. <laughs> and we are gonna be exploring sustainable home landscaping. Yeah, well, I am so excited to talk to you all about what to consider when transforming your yard. Uh, other than the fact that I've transformed my own front yard, I have developed uh, our how-to guides, uh, resources, and videos through the years for tree people. And I'm so excited to be able to um, share some of those with you today. So, um, oh my goodness. So first of all, I wanted to let you know that uh, we have a variety of how-to resources and all that's gonna help you. And so right up front, I wanted to let you know, you don't have to worry about scribbling up a bunch of notes because um, uh, we will be, we're recording this, we will send you a copy of this and I will provide you with links to uh, the various different things that I talk about today, including a native plant starter list and a, a climate appropriate non-native starter list. So all those things uh, you will have uh, as soon as we're done here. All right, so today we're gonna talk about uh, how to create a nature-based sustainable landscape. So putting that question out there, what do you think of, uh, what do you think is a nature-based sustainable landscape? And Alex, I'll need you to share with me any, any responses that we get. Anybody? We're hearing very little water and care, native mm. plants, using California native plants, Fabulous. So for me, a nature-based uh, uh, landscape is when soil, water, and plants all come together to create a healthy, climate-appropriate ecosystem. You know, one that works with the land, not just for looks, but also for environmental benefits. It has water, soil, and plants all working together and considers weather and climate, uh, available water and healthy soil. So let's take a look at this more closely. All right, so time to reduce the use of grass. Uh, in thinking about creating a nature-based landscape here in Southern California, that means reducing or limiting our use of grass and choosing a more nature-based landscape. So again, you know, water, plants, and soil are all working together. And when we do this, not only are we using less water, reducing the amount of green waste created, but it actually takes less maintenance. So if you don't believe me, there was actually a nine-year study done. And that study used those two homes that I just showed you, right? The one that was all grass, Right next door was the one using native plants. And through that, that nine-year study, it showed that it used 83%, that the, the native garden one used 83% less water, generated 56% less green waste, and required 68% less maintenance. How is that possible, right? <laughs> Looking at the two, well, it generated less of the green waste because there wasn't weekly lawn mowing, right? That generates grass clippings. And, and actually, um, once those native plants are established, native plant gardens typically at most need only monthly trimming uh, and, and weeding. So that requires a lot less maintenance. 
But what about the water, right? So why so much less water use? Well, to help better understand that, um, we have to understand that we are part of a Mediterranean climate. And I love sharing this with folks because it's just, it's so extraordinary. Where we live in Southern California, we are one of five different locations on the earth that has a Mediterranean climate. And so um, as, you can, as you can see here, they're located on uh, between 30 and 40 degrees north and south latitude. And, if you, and they're on west coast. So if you follow along here, we get Southern California. We keep going and we get the Mediterranean area. And then on the south part, you hit central Chile, South Africa, and then Southern Australia. So in all those five areas, we all share um, a similar climate, which is six months of cool, wet winters and six months of hot, dry summers with, with, with pretty much no rain, right? And so those areas and that weather, that climate, uh, the plant and tree life native to these areas are adapted to this kind of climate. And so in looking at our weather pattern here and why native plants are so important, looking at this chart, right? We've got January through December and we've got rainfall in inches. So typically for us here in SoCal, in January, we'll get somewhere around 2.75 inches of rain and it dips a little in April and then it starts to go down, right? And we get nothing, nothing in the middle of our summer. And here we are just the beginnings of October, right? And we just seem to got a little bit of rain recently and, and technically that'll increase. And so this is our typical weather pattern. When we plant high water need plants, such as grass and azaleas, those plants need most of their water in the summertime, right? And so we're needing to use a lot of water that, that, that is coming from um, other places, right? It's not, it's not during the rainy season. And so we're having to provide a lot of our imported water just to maintain our high water need plants. If we plant more medium water need plants like our roses and jasmine, they, they need less water, but again, the majority of their water need is during the hot summer months. Now, this is the good news, right? When we plant our native or climate appropriate plants, they follow the same rain, that their need for water follows our same weather pattern, right? Their greatest need for water is when we have most of our rainfall. And then they go into more of a dormant state and don't need as much water or little to no water in the summer. And then they start needing water again. And so in looking at this, these are more nature-based solutions to think about for your garden. They follow our, follow our typical weather pattern. I will say something to note about this is that when we have, if you do have a native plant garden that you've planted and you're, and we didn't get an adequate winter of rain, it's best to provide water during the winter for these, uh, to, to simulate the, the same as if it were getting rainfall during this time, but not needing to do it during the summer. All right. So now that you kind of understand a better idea about why using native or climate appropriate plants are so important, especially given that we are part of, you know, a Mediterranean biome, um, let's look at, uh, at how we can start to look at our, our landscape, right? So when I was deciding to redo my front yard and walk my talk, um, a friend of mine who designs native plant gardens came to my house and we literally stood in the front and she's like, take a look at this space. What do you want to do with it? Right. And so 
you know, start to, to note down things such as, do you want to attract wildlife such as butterflies and hummingbirds? Those are going to inform the sort of plants that I'm going to choose, right? Or do you want to add fun elements to your garden, like a bench or um, a fountain or a bird feeder? All of those will start to play into your design. Think about, do you want to add pathways or, or there's um, the options of uh, beautiful native trees that can go in these spaces that get that flowering trees, um, you know, just to add some interest to your garden. Again, more things to think about. Let's see. And for some people, they may not want to get rid of all their grass, but where can you reduce that grass, right? You know, I kept some of it in my backyard, but now it's all gone now, but in the, but in the front, reducing that grass. And another thing to think about is, is color, you know, like what kind of color or textures, these are all things that you'll start to want to explore. So getting in front and taking a look at your space and starting to think about what do you want to, what do you see? What do you want to achieve? Right. And so once you start to play around with what you may like, um, you know, and look at other people's yards or, or uh, for other images to start to think about that. Now you have to do a little bit of your own homework about, um, about your own space, right? Uh, it's going to take a little detective work so that you can get the appropriate plants for your yard. So the first thing you're going to want to do is look at your climate zone. So I've been talking a lot about climate and because a plant's performance needs to take into account total climate, which includes kind of the length of the growing season, timing, rainfall, your winter lows, your summer highs, wind, humidity, all those things play into how well your plants are going to do, right? And so nicely enough, Sunset Magazine for California created these great sunset climate zones. And, and I say this is important because um, looking at the folks that are here today, there are some that live in the valley like myself. And the weather that I have here, my climate is very different than my friends who live out in Santa Monica or Venice out by the coast, right? And so climate is really important. So in looking at these maps here, uh, I'm not sure, can you, you might start to see, and I will give you, send you the links to the Sunset Climate Zone so you can catch them yourselves. But for example, I'm here in the valley, so I'm climate zone 18. And so I'll want to pick plants to do well in climate zone 18. And then you can see surrounding that area is, is that it starts to build an elevation. It's 19, then you've got your, your Santa Monica's here in, the, in uh, 21. And then along the coast is 24, completely different. And then a lot over here on the left, a lot of LA, you've got 22, uh, and then a little bit of the highlands in 23. So I hope that makes sense. Can you guys see your climate zone? Anybody out there know their climate zone? Seeing 20. Great. And like I said, I'll be sure that you have a link so that you can look it up and you'll know. 22, um, 9, 21, 18, me fabulous. 23. Yeah, yep. <laughs> 24. Perfect. Hold on to that knowledge. <laughs> um, another thing to take note. So now you, now you know that you should know your climate zone. Another thing to note is your soil texture, right? Soil texture. Well, Soil texture tells us how much sand, silt, and clay we have in our soil. And so this is important when it comes to, again, I'll, to the sort of plants that you're choosing because plants do well in certain kind of soil textures. And so uh, sand is the largest particle, okay? These particles are round and are about the size of the end of a number 10 or a number, um, yeah, number two pencil. And uh, you can easily see them, the individual particles. Think about sand at the beach, right? And so larger than this, the particles are considered pebbles. 
Um, but because they're so large, water passes through it easily. Uh, sandy soil doesn't hold water very well. And so um, think of a glass of water with a bunch of ping pong balls that are representing sand. And when you pour that water in, there's all those air pockets. So if you have sandy soil, you have well draining soil. Water passes through very easily. So the next size up is silt. And um, silt is also round, but much, much smaller. You need a microscope a microscope to actually see the individual particles. Um, silty soils are slick and slippery when wet. And then they're kind of, um, they're like flour when they're dry, right? And then lastly, you've got clay. And clay is super tiny. In fact, it's so small, you'd need um, an electron microscope in order to see each of those individual particles. Um, but unlike sand and, and silt, clay particles are flat, they're not round. And so they're, they're kind of like a plate and they sit on top of each other. And so when water tries to move through them, it's much more slow because they're having to move themselves um, between each of those plates. And so um, uh, there isn't a lot of airspace. And so clay soils, uh, have an extremely high water holding capacity because that water moves so much slowly and water it's hard to infiltrate. So probably your soil is a combination of the different textures of soil. But, but as I was saying, um, it's important to take note of that. For example, um, if you were to plant purple sage in your yard, purple sage prefers um, uh, sandy or loamy soil. It does not like clay. It needs more fast draining soils. And so if you find that you have a high clay content, probably instead of choosing purple sage, you might choose white sage because white sage does fine in, in, in soils that have clay, right? I hope that makes sense. Um, so I will be uh, sending to you all our how-tos on how to do a soil texture test to figure out what is the texture of your soil. But um, pretty much what you'll end up doing is, is going into your yard where you're planning to plant and you'll be pushing away kind of the mulch or things on top and getting down to the actual soil and digging some out, right? And then once you have that soil, that pure soil, you're gonna be adding water to it. You're gonna create like a, a nice ball of soil. Now, if that ball falls apart, you've got sandy soil, right? But if it's holding together, you're going to take that, that clump of soil and you're going to move it between your thumb and your forefinger to create a ribbon. And then you're going to take note of, you're going to keep pushing until that ribbon falls off and take note at how large that ribbon is. Is it less than an inch? Is it an inch? Or is it more than an inch? Then you're gonna take some of that soil and you're gonna put it in your hand and, and again with some water and rub it. And you're gonna know, is it really gritty or is it slick and smooth? And so with the info that I'm sending you, you're gonna take that combination of information of how wide, how long that, that um, ribbon of soil was and the texture of your soil. And it's gonna tell you whether you're, you have a sandy loam or, or a, a, a clay, more clay-based, it's gonna give you the texture of your soil. That'll give you uh, that information about what you've got going on in your garden. The other test that I like to do is the soil drainage test. And a soil drainage test is great for someone like myself who put a rain garden in my front yard. And a rain garden is where I have water being directed off my gar uh, my garage roof and it's being directed into my into a basin in my front yard and and when it rains my water uh, the the rainwater drains into my soil it, it's got a good drainage if you do the soil drainage test and you find that that, that you've got a lake that it's taking hours for that water to sink in you're not going to want to put a rain garden in your front yard so anyways, I'll have instructions on how to do that as well. Um, all right. So now that you know your climate and your soil type, and you're gonna take a look at your front yard, you know, the whether you've got more sun exposure or shade, what you're dealing with, 
we have a great native plant starter list. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to be sharing that with you. And it's arranged by uh, low plants and list out a bunch of those medium plants, and then it gets more into your taller plants. And so let's take a look and you'll see that it's that we've got these nice lists going, but I'm going to show you one up close. All right. So we're going to take a look at common yarrow. So if you've done your, your homework and your detective work, you can take a look at our list and you're going to start to think, okay, if I'm going to have some low plants coming in the front of my garden, I might consider common yarrow, right? And so common yarrow, right here, it'll tell you it's a perennial, a P, which means that this plant will be there year round, and which is great. Oop, it's not what I wanted. Hold on, let me go back. There we go. Um, climate zone, it'll tell you whether this is appropriate for climate zone. Looking at, at yarrow here, this will do great in the valley as well and as well as on the other side by the coast and throughout LA. So it's, it's a great native for all over our area. Then these two uh, are very important. We've got um, low water use, very low water use, medium, and, and I don't even think, we're, we're not going to list any high water need plants in, in our native list here. But um, what you'll see here is that if you're in the LA Basin in zones 22 to 24, it's a low water use plant. And it may be different in the valley, but it's not. This one is also a low water use plant for the valley area. Now, this is really great information, especially for people who say, but, but Chris, I love my roses. I want to keep my roses. And that's great. Do that. But be sure that if, if, you, uh, if you know the water use plant, the, the water use of all your plants, then you can do what we call hydrozoning. So put your roses all together and just know that when you're watering them, they're going to need more water. And then you have your low and your very low use water plants all planted together. So they're getting their appropriate water. I hope that makes sense. But if you mix the two and you have your roses among your natives that are low water use plant, someone's going to die. They're either going to get too much water or not enough. All right. So continuing on, we've got sun. So this one tells me that it does well in sun and partial shade. It'd have an SH if it was shade. And again, knowing where you're going to plant and looking at that, in my front yard, it's, it's full sun exposure. In my backyard, it's, it's, um, it's, north, fa it's um, north facing, so it's more shady. And so- Chris, uh, I do, I do want to say someone, I'm oh, sorry, just scary. <laughs> Someone does want to see a picture of your rain garden. It's coming. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, and so um, it, it's important to know that, that you're going to choose plants that are appropriate for the sun exposure that you're having. And then here you go. Here's soil. And so great. Yarrow does great in all three of those soil types. So that's a great one. And then this, height and width. This is super important, folks. I see this happen time and time again. I'm going to show you some examples later, but please, when you're going and choosing your plants, note the height and the width of what they're going to be at maturity. I have learned the hard way and I've seen it happen. And because people get so enthusiastic and they've got a big space they want to cover. So they get twice as many plants that they need and start plopping them in. And then their plants start to grow. And then they're elbowing each other out and you're creating a maintenance mess. I even um, uh, catch myself because I planted a Yankee Point Ceanothus too close to my sidewalk in the corner of my garden. And I have to go out there and trim it because it's a large plant. It grows pretty wide and I, and I didn't pull it in far enough. And so I'll show you some examples of this. But remember and take note of what that, that plant is going to be at maturity. And then we have some other fun information like the flower color, uh, the season that it colors, and then a great maintenance notes. Um, and that's a good thing to take note of too, because if you're okay with more maintenance, then, then make sure if you don't want as much maintenance, choose, choose plants that don't require a whole lot. And this will give you some hints into that. So a question, um, yeah. when, crowd, when crowding happens, what are the steps for transplanting? Or is that, 
is that the larger topic? Um, it's, I mean, it depends if you're finding out that it's, uh, if the plants are small, transplanting shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's, it's like anything else, you know, you can, it depends on how mature it is, or you may just remove that one and try it out in another location, but you're, you're digging out, um, plants do pretty well when they're, uh, when you trim out some of those outer roots, right? It, it should do okay, but but you're taking a chance and you'll want to, you'll definitely want to replant it, but you're gonna dig out far enough to where the edge of those, the plant branches are and dig that out and then move it into a hole that's of that similar size. And then do we know if the sunset climate zones uh, reach into the Orange County area as well? Yes. Yes, right. it's for California. It's great. Perfect. Um, yeah. All right. So I've got this great plant list for you, right? Well, what if um, what if those plants, you can't find them at your local nursery, right? And so my suggestion is for you to um, go to the nursery and, and take a look. And uh, the thing is, um, you may see things that you like or fit the color profile or whatever, but those little tags that they put in the in the um, in the containers don't give you enough information. It may say native or it may say drought tolerant, um, but again, as you've learned, it's not enough information. So. Um, so write it down and and write down the common name and the botanical name that it gives you and then come home because uh, you're going to want to do a little bit more research about them before you start purchasing them. Right. And so one thing you can do uh, is once you've looked at the plants, you can go to Wuckles. Um, this is a, a great site. It's um, it's water use classification of landscape species. There you go. And what's great about this is that they have a list of 3,500 plants used in California landscapes. And so again, what this is, this information is going to give you about the water use. Okay. And so um, what you'll do when you get to the site is you're going to go there and then over here, you're going to see C Wuckles list for all regions. You're going to click that, go there, and that'll take you over to the plant search area. Um, then it will, so on this list, you'll go across the top and you'll scroll down and find your plant. If you're in the LA area, you'll be looking at either South Coastal Column, which is sunset climate zones 20 through to 22 to 24, or you're going to look in the South Inland Valley column, which is sunset climate zone 18 to 21. And, you know, it depends on where you live. And so go down that column until you find your plant and it'll tell you if it's, if it's low use, if it's moderate, if it's very low, or if it's inappropriate, right? So this is a great site to just double check that you're, that you're getting the water use that, that uh, works best for your garden. Um, all right. So, you had one question about mm -hmm. does L uh, for soil type, is L the same as silt? Loam. loam. L is loam. And I will tell you um, that uh, in the in the thing that I'm going to send you on how to do it, it'll tell you whether it's sand, silt, or loam. And that and that's kind of loam is a combination of all of those. But the um, the plant list at the back end has a um, what's it called? It tells you what all the what all the the letters mean. It's the um, help me out, Alex. <laughs> the key. The, the key. Yes, we have a key. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't it, find the unmute. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's it's key, and it'll it'll list out and give more information about what all those things mean. Promise. Um, okay, and so um, now that you've done your detective work, right, and and you're going to start to plan and you've, you've kind of figured out where you're gonna put things based on their size and their width, 
the color palettes that you're choosing, you know, maybe some lower things in the front, medium, and then larger things maybe up against the wall. And, and figuring that out, adding interest, maybe a pathway and stuff, you know, so you've planned and then you want to prepare your yard. And um, for some, that means removing your grass. And so a great thing to do is to sheet mulch and uh, we'll send you some information on how to do that. Basically, you're, you're wetting down the area, you're covering it with cardboard, you're putting mulch on top and, and wetting it down. And, and it's basically depriving that grass of, of ox, you know, of oxygen and, and well, of sunlight. And so it's killing the grass underneath. And then once it's done that, you can literally, the, the cardboard will decompose and you can push it away and install your plants. Um, I will tell you that uh, if you are removing lawn, uh, check out LA City and County have a cash for grass program. And so it's great because if, if you're, if, take a picture of your before, take a picture of your after, and then you'll get a nice little check in the mail that you can use to um, purchase your plants. Um, another thing I want you to consider once you've kind of removed every, you know, your area of, of grass is to um, consider contouring. Okay. And so contouring is a, is a lovely thing to do because um, it not only adds interest to your yard, but it allows, uh, it's designed to slow the flow of water. And so the goal is to take your rainwater and slow it down by, by allowing it to flow slowly, spread out and sink in. And so by adding berms, and I, I show you some examples by adding berms or some sway, so berms go up and swales are a U and go down, you're adding this lovely interest to your garden rather than just kind of flat, okay? Um, all right, and so uh, as I was sharing before, when it does come time to, to plant, you're gonna have to be patient with your plants. And so uh, as an example, here's a home uh, of a tree people member who uh, lots of grass, right? Lots of flat grass and decided to change out their landscape. And so here's um, a picture of what happened right after installation. It's a little hard with this pick, but there's, there's some higher areas and lower areas here. They added a rain chain from their gutter off of their garage that directs water under their little pathway and into this dry creek bed, this, this bioswale. And they've planted a nice little red bud here, but you can see the plants are tiny, lots of mulch, and you think, well, you know, this doesn't look like enough plants, but then here we go. It's starting, the plants are starting to stretch out and grow and get established. And you can see more of the, you know, kind of more of our berms and our swales and our hills and valleys, right? And so the plants are, are it, it takes a good two to three years for, for a lot of our natives to really um, get established and drop down these really lovely deep roots that they have. Um, so you can see they're starting to get established. And then like three or four years later, Look at that, pretty fabulous. Just love, love, love what they've done. And you can see they have kind of low growing um, uh, ground cover in the front, medium size here. It looks like the red bud is growing and uh, this is during a season that it's deciduous, so it loses its leaves. But what's beautiful about red buds is that they're not too huge of a tree, but but pretty soon it's gonna burst out in these beautiful fuchsia colored flowers all along those branches, even without the, their leaves. And then you've got higher, higher um, natives in the back, same thing going on here. And it looks like they held on to their bougainvillea, so it needs a little more water, but they didn't get rid of, of all their existing plants. So then, all right, here you go super messy but when I got started here's my front yard <laughs> and you can see I was kind of taking a look at what I wanted to do and I and it has evolved from this point but I, I created berm and a basin to create a rain garden 
You can't tell here, but it's raised here again to slow that water. And then I've got another raised area over here, kind of defining my area from my pathway. And on the other side of that raised area is where I take my, my garbage cans out to the street, all right? And I added um, uh, um, a narrow pathway over here. You can't see, but I've got a nice little seating area. And then this is where um, I redirected my downspout across the, the planter that was there. And the water comes out on these larger boulders that create my a little bit of a swale, but it directs the water down into my basin. And then since then, this is last spring, it gets pretty crazy, um, but you can see my fun little sitting area. You can still see where the water travels across my little pathway. I added some urbanite. Someone was taking out their driveway and grab sun to define my, my uh, pathway. And in the spring, my plants go wild. And this is just before you start to see all the color in there of my Encelia, my sunflower and my purple sage and my, um, uh, over here is my Ceanothus and I've got some uh, monkey flower in there. And then this one here in the front, love, love, love that one because uh, that, other than the fact that it spreads and I have to keep pulling out areas where it's spreading where I don't want it to. What's cool about it, it's a California fuchsia that looks really kind of pretty in its um, bluey gray colors. But in right now and through winter, it gets its red trumpety flowers, which means that in a season where I don't normally have a lot of color, I've got all this beautiful red California fuchsia growing. It's lovely. Um, all right, so there's mine. So here are just a few of my, some of my favorites other than red bud that I have in my yard. Desert willows are beautiful, lovely, lovely, um, very climate appropriate. Uh, they get these beautiful pink flowers and uh, lovely option for gardens. Uh, like I said, they don't get huge. So they're nice accent plant as well. Um, as I shared, I love monkey flower. I love the name. That's probably why I love it so much. Uh, but sticky monkey flower comes in a variety of colors. Uh, you might see it out in the wild and, and mainly what you might find is orange, but I've seen it in beautiful rust colors, in variegated pinks, it's, it's lovely. Uh, and then, yeah, I love my purple sage, <laughs> but if you've got space for it, uh, it's beautiful, but it gets very, very large. And so uh, what I love about it is not only is it got this beautiful um, uh, odor to it, it's, it's, it's lovely, it's a sage, right? Um, but it gets these beautiful purple flowers, stalks of, of purple that the butterflies, the bees, the hummingbirds love it. And so, um, and then by summertime, those, those flower stalks die off and I leave them through the summer. In fact, it's, it's pretty much now that it's cooling down, I'll go out and start to trim off all those dead uh, flower heads. But I leave them through the summer because they go to seed and provide food for other wildlife like the birds. So another favorite. All right, so in reviewing, you want to determine, you know, what do you want to do with your space? So take a look. Determine your climate zone and your soil texture so you can know a little bit more about uh, what is appropriate, what plants will do well in your space. Uh, check out our plant starter lists uh, to see and mark what grows well in your garden. Learn the size and shape. If you don't see, uh, you know, Google those plants to see what they look like. Do they have the colors and textures that you're looking for? Check what you've got going on in your local nursery. I, I do encourage you to support our local um, uh, native plant nurseries uh, because, you know, they're, they're propagating and doing the good work uh, around supporting um, shifting to natives. But uh, but you can also check out what's going on in your own local nursery. And I love to encourage them to grow their offerings uh, around more natives and climate appropriate plants. So check out your nursery, 
and then you know write those down and then check it on Wuckles. Is it gonna is it gonna make sense water wise and create a plan? And honestly, I started out with one plan and I shifted and changes that I went and I I learned from my own lessons. But but I love you know how things evolved in my garden and that's part of the fun of it all. And so um, I hope today was was just enough to to get you started. And there you go. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, if, if anyone has any, uh, please let us know in the chat. I think we've yeah, covered- Yeah, any questions, yeah. We've covered most of them. I was, I was I'm was. i sorry I startled you the first time. But, uh, That's what but, happens when I've got it in my ear, you know? Ah, <laughs> uh, we're hearing uh, help with gophers. So I would assume that's a gopher cage. Wait, say that again? Oh, uh, someone's asking for help with gophers, please. Gophers. 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 Rodent. Gophers. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. Gophers. Gophers. Wow. Gophers. You know, there are some wildlife that are hard to battle with. Um, all I can say is that um, not dealing with them in my yard, but I do know that at Tree People, when we are um, working in areas where we're doing mountain restoration, we have to put gopher cages in, right? We have to plant the plant. So you're gonna to need to dig your hole a little wider and a little deeper. And you're going to, um, uh, we've used chicken wire uh, in the past, but there's another product that Tree People is currently using that is this beautiful soft mesh stuff. And, and I will find, um, Alex, take note and let's find out what it is so we can put that in the materials that we send. Mm -hmm. But it's, but it's great because what they do is it's, it's, it's already a tube and they, they cut it and they tie off one end. It's kind of like a beanie, right? And then you flip it down and the plant fits in there nicely and you stick that in the soil and eventually it'll break away. But in the meantime, until that plant gets established, it'll hopefully help to keep some of those gophers away. Um, we have another question about killing grass. When is the best time? St. Augustine in the front yard. Uh, is it too late? Did, did they already miss their chance to cycle? I don't think so. You know, our weather, geez, it's gonna, you know, like, I think there's no, I think, all times are great times to reduce your grass. And so, uh, in fact, it, it, if we start to get cooler weather, it may work in your favor too, because you'll want to keep, um, you'll want to encourage uh, the mulch to stay a little moist, but, but go for it. You know, it's, and if it's, if it's a lot to take on your whole yard, um, I will say that I, I sheet mulched mine and it still took a while uh, to get rid of everything. I have an issue with crabgrass that I hate and, and I'm still dealing with some of it along the cracks of the sidewalk. And so it's just gonna, it's just gonna take time and an effort, but, but if you're ready to go for it, just do it. Get, um, uh, uh, get some good cardboard. I found that if you go to, if you've got, um, Costco and you go in there and you ask them if you can take the cardboard, not the boxes, but they've got those big pallets of product and, and they're separated by these giant squares of cardboard. If you can ask them if you can have those, they, they give you a nice big flat cardboard without a bunch of you know tape and, and stuff like that. And then um, get, get a dump of mulch. Um, do not buy mulch at a, at a, at a, don't purchase mulch, basically mulch in a bag. What you can do, and, and again, I will send you info on this, is um, call a local arborist, right? I have a, a one that I use here in the Valley, all about trees. And literally they uh, trim trees with their big giant truck that goes through. And then what they have left over is mulch. And they typically have to go and spend money to have that dumped. And so they would much rather give it to folks like me who want it in their yard. Now, what you'll do is you'll give them a call and say, hey, I need some mulch for my yard. What good chippy stuff do you have? Because you don't want to be, you want to be sure they're not giving you something from a tree that's diseased or palms or oleanders or, or, or sticky stuff, you know? 
and, and my guy, when I call, they, they know what I'm talking about, that I'm a, you know, I'm a gardener at home and I would love some good chippy mulch. And so they look at their, their schedule and they're like, okay, Chris, we can bring some, they dump a bunch. Like it's a big mound, but I, but you know, share it with your neighbors, get it in all the spots in your yard. And if you're clearing out that big grass area, dump it on. Um, we've got some questions about, um, can you elaborate on with going native plants versus uh, climate appropriate plants, desert willow versus Australian willow? So, so I use climate appropriate because, um, because they're, they're, they're similar, right? Just because they're not from here, they may, like I have a rosemary that I grow that I love um, because it's, I cook with it and, but it's, but it's more indigenous to the Mediterranean region, but it's climate appropriate. It's, it's appropriate to our climate. It's very low use water, a low water use plant. Does that make sense? And, um, and then again, your different trees, this is gonna have you doing your research between what's gonna work good for your garden. Um, uh, there's some that are in the same type of species with different names. Um, desert willow versus, what was the other one? Australian willow. Gosh, I'm trying to remember the Australian willow. If it's, I mean, I, sh I shared the non native um, climate appropriate plant starter guide. So, yes. So we will have that and look at, look at that list because if it's, if it's not necessarily from this area, but take a look again, it's the same thing. You know, what is, what is the climate zone? There's a, there's a great site um, uh, called Select, let me see. I think it's selecttree.com and there's just the one T. So it's selecttree.com. It's put out by Cal Poly and I love it. And that one you can do is you can put in the name of the tree and it will tell you the climate zone and it will give you all those attributes as well. Ah, uh, so, great. And then, oh, what? What's, <laughs> I was going to say, someone's asking about raccoons. Oh, and then for the mulch, do they dump 20 cubic yards of mulch? That's you know, what they're worried about. <laughs> so talk to your people, talk, okay. talk to the, yeah. talk to them, say, you know, I only need X amount. And I believe I'm pretty sure in our materials that it tells you how to measure how much, how much you need based on your space. Um, I'm hearing, oh, this is very interesting. Fire prevention in extremely dry hills. We were advised to not use mulch with wood chips, twigs, branches, and dead leaves. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And um, when you're considering, when you're, cons and, and I, and please, I am not an expert here, but this is based on what I've, I've learned. And, uh, and Alex, we can send them that other website, mm -hmm. the one that talks about, we have a great website that Tree People was on the advisory for, um, that gives you exactly how to zone out for if you're in um, a fire, a high fire area or on a, um, uh, an urban wildlife uh, zone, you know, like right up against the mountains. But, but yes, what you're saying about mulch is correct. What you want to be sure is that you're not having that mulch right up against your house. If you're, if you're in an area like that, you're going to want to not have any plants up against a structure that could bring, you know, that fire could bring to that area. What I, so gravel is more appropriate in and around, you know, those first six feet or so. And then beyond that, um, what I've heard that mulch is okay, like if you're talking about that real uh, chippy stuff, the larger, the larger thing, because what you're trying to prevent is stuff that um, it does more smoldering. So again, it's it's going to depend on what else is growing in your area, and and you don't want those plants to become super dry. So you're going to want to be sure that they're getting adequate water. So you've got nice nice healthy plants. Um, but uh, to answer that better, I'm, we're going to send you that link. Uh, we got someone asking about West Lake climate zones. I just put that in the chat. Um, we will also send that out. This was interesting. We have a slight hill from the front yard down to the sidewalk. Which plants are best to keep the water from running off? And that I'm assuming that's going to include some 
work with the terrain. Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is what I taught what I'm saying about contouring, you know. If there's if you've got that kind of slope, I would see about building up a berm on the edge there to pull it up so you're not getting all that um, as much of that uh, water loss. So if you can if you can pull up the end a little bit by berming it, but there's some there's some lovely ground covers like there's a, a white sage that grows really wide and it gets a lot of those nice um, uh, uh, good deep hole, you know, ground holding roots. There's some um, uh, versions of ceanothus that are low growing and again, grow really wide, but they're more, they're more um, bush-like, if that makes sense. So they're, they're more bush-like as opposed to lovely yarrows that are, that aren't as, as, um, hard woody, if that makes sense. But, but yeah, there's, I would, I would see about, you know, contouring the land there to bring that up and also planting, you know, maybe even to go up and over um, some of those um, spreading low growing sages or ceanothus or, or other plants like that. We're getting quite a few comments about raccoons. I, I don't know, folks. Yeah. Sorry I about that one. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I deal with, I, I did used to deal with raccoons, but not anything that was um, harming my, um, that had to do with my landscape. It was more had to do with my chickens in my backyard than that. But I have um, uh, possums, I have squirrels, I have, I have all, my, my yard is wildlife heaven, right? I will say that once I converted my front yard, all the I mean, the, the morning doves come and love walking around my yard and the birds and the butterflies. It was just it's astounding to see the diversity of wildlife that it attracts. It's, it's lovely. But sorry, folks, I don't know about raccoons. <laughs> um, and then someone's asking about roses. But again, we you can plant roses by... Plant roses. Pick your roses. Just what I say, hydrozone. And, and hydrozoning is about looking again at the water needs of your plants and being sure that you're putting your roses in that particular garden and and maybe putting in uh if you're if you're using drip irrigation that is going to be on a separate line than the other ones right so that when you time it those roses are getting more water than your other low water use plants and then i don't someone's asking for a native garden designer consultant um i would say I don't, I don't know if we can, yeah, we don't. It's it's rough. We we tend to stay away from like um, having lists of folks and people we give out because things can change and I'd hate for, you know, someone to move away or we give somebody and then it wasn't a good recommendation after all. But um, um, I, here's one, uh, go to G3, Green Garden Group website, and I believe on their website, they have um, uh, landscape designers that are part of that group, part of the Green Garden group. Uh, that should give you a list to, to go from. Someone's saying they planted coyote brush pigeon point on their hillside slope. So yeah, um, great. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and so we'll be sent, again, this has been recorded. Um, we will be sending out this recording and then all of these materials with the website links, it's all on our website. Uh, and if not, it's on our website, we will give you the link. So, and I just wanna thank Chris for giving this wildly informative talk. It was, I, I learned so much and I work here. <laughs> so, <laughs> good, good, um, good. Well, thank so you thank all. You. And then thank again, you for showing if, up. If you want to get involved, treepeople.org. We've got treepeople.org slash volunteer if you want to get out there with us. Treepeople.org if you want to donate. Um, so thank you so much. And we will see you all soon.